a pleasure uh, to be here. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes? Okay, thanks. Um, so, a couple of questions to start. First of all, I'm happy to answer any questions at any time. So, if you have a question, just shoot your hand up and I'll try to address it uh, when asked. Um, so, show of hands, how many people have wells? <laughs> All right. How many people regularly test their wells? <laughs> okay, so it looked like maybe two thirds have wells and maybe a couple people test their wells. <laughs> How many people test their well on a regular basis? What's that mean? <laughs> Stick around and I'll tell you. <laughs> okay, so. What I'm going to do um, in the next uh, 40 minutes or so, 45 minutes or so, and then hopefully have time for questions, is talk about what's in your drinking water, is your drinking water safe, and my goal today is to convince you that to really be sure your drinking water is safe, you need to take responsibility and test not only well water, but tap water. And the good news is there are things you can do to make it safe for you and your families. And the important message is I see Maverick here and I don't see any other children, but in our population, those that are the most susceptible to toxins and metals in our drinking water are children and pregnant mothers. So if you do it for no other reason, do it for your kids. Okay. So if I can figure out how to do this, right. So, to start out with a couple slides taken from the recent literature, this is January uh, 2016. Federal emergency is declared in Flint over contaminated water. How many know about the Flint water crisis? Okay, everybody. So they changed water supplies in Flint, Michigan, and the water, the new water that they used was, was very corrosive, and what it did is it leached the water, um, the uh, um, sorry, the lead out of the pipes in the city. The water itself was safe in the reservoirs, but when it leached the lead out of the pipes, when it went to the tap, it had high lead levels. One of the problems was the administrators who are legally responsible, according to the EPA rules, for making sure that water is safe, did not adhere to the federal regulations and guidelines. So our public officials in this particular city let us down, let the <coughs> citizens of Flint, Michigan down. But is it just restricted to Flint? Schools in Massachusetts districts, 20 districts, had high levels of lead in the water. This is from June 6th of this year. Cape Cod's drinking water problem. Another article. Essentially every single well, every single water supply in Cape Cod is contaminated with one chemical or another. Anybody want to take a guess what's in the tap water on Cape Cod? There's salts, Maverick, you want to try? Mercury? Mercury, yeah. I'm just going to look at the list here. Antibiotics, statins, nicotine metabolites, mood stabilizers, progesterone, artificial sweeteners. <laughs> Tested levels. And it's just not Cape Cod. Now, I will say that the levels are very low. They're not levels that would be prescribed for these drugs. But what we don't know is what effect these really low levels have. And moreover, what we know from our Dartmouth Superfund research program is that when you take really, really low levels of a number of drugs and put them together, they then have biological effects. Sir, you had a question? I'm just trying to understand what, what is a low level enough not to have to worry about. Because it's always, there's always going to be some there. Nobody, that's a great question, and actually nobody knows the answer. The National Institutes of Environmental Health funds the Dartmouth program and 12 other programs in the United States to address those kinds of issues. What are the effects of low levels of drugs and metals and toxins on our health? And moreover, in this case, where there are many of these toxins and drugs, it, where you're exposed at the same time to many of them, what effects do they have on biology? on human health, and that's one of the things that, that we're doing. The government is funding this kind of research. I did research, and, and for the for child development, it's, it's four and under, and, and, uh. <laughs> This is 
Maverick, by the way, guys. Ten parts per billion? Of? That's what the EPA allows? Of what? For arsenic? That's correct. But, but, if show you some data on that in a couple slides from them, okay? Bruce, yes. I read that article, it's from a, a Cape Cod, and am I correct that it's because people are flushing yes. their, their medications and therefore you're getting these levels? Well, that's part of it, but um, in your, your kidneys and your urine are one of the major uh, excretory mechanisms of these drugs. So that's the other way, you're, it's a part of the natural elimination, but, that, but uh, Gene is completely right. Um, in fact, the FDA and others advise you not to, to flush your uh, unused medications down the, the, the toilet for, for that reason, because it can contaminate the groundwater. Here's another one. As, many, as much as 90% of groundwater in Massachusetts may be corrosive. And you remember, like Flint, the corrosive water tends to leach lead out of the pipes. One of the guys who was interviewed uh, for this article said that the FDA regulates water at the source, not at the tap. Our findings suggest that people who use private wells for their water supply should really have their water tested at the tap. And my comment is, I agree. The EPA <laughs> takes action to address lead in drinking water in Tarrytown, New York. Again, New York uh, was a New York Times article just a couple days ago, and the gist of this is that the administrators who are responsible for making sure that the water is um, clean and healthy didn't adhere to the, to the EPA guidelines. They didn't adhere to the Safe Water Drinking Act. Um, so unfortunately, sometimes our public um, employees don't do their jobs. And that's certainly what happened in Flint, and that's what happened in Tarrytown. And that's one of the points that I'd like to make. So ultimately, we have to take responsibility to make sure that our water is, is clean and safe. So what is the Safe Drinking Water Act? 1974, it was passed, President Kennedy, it's federal law, I'm sorry, not Kennedy, um, federal law to ensure safe drinking water. EPA is responsible for setting standards and overseeing water supplies. There are 155,000 public water systems in the US. It does not cover private wells doesn't apply to bottled water. That's under the auspices of the FDA. Um, some states have legislation to reduce arsenic in drinking water, and particularly well water. And in fact, in Maine, there was a, a legislation that uh, went uh, to, to the, the state last year, an act to ensure safe drinking water for all Maine families. Um, Emma Hallis O'Connor, who's here somewhere in the back. Emma, put your hand up. She drove up from Portland today. Emma and her group, uh, the Environmental Health Strategy Center, played a really major role. Um, it initially passed, the governor vetoed it, and then on secondary consideration, the act did not pass. Um, so Emma's working doubly hard in her group to, to get that passed in the next uh, session, I believe. So Safe Drinking Water Act. It's worth noting that that, that was passed when, when Nixon was president. Nixon, yeah. I corrected uh, Kennedy, but I forgot it was Nixon. Um, okay, what does the Safe Drinking Water Act of 74 include? Microorganisms like E. coli, everybody knows about E. coli, disinfectants, disinfected byproducts, inorganic chemicals including arsenic, lead, and mercury. Um, in 86, they passed an amendment um, to reduce the amount of lead in the solder that the plumbers use to um, put the pipes together. Um, organic chemicals, 53 organic compounds like benzene, dioxin, pesticides, and radionuclides it, as well. Um, so, obviously, Jerry gave the introduction. We're going to talk a little bit about arsenic. Um, so, the EPA has established, the Environmental Protection Agency has established a list of substances that pose the most threat to public health. And the way the EPA defines it, it is not the ones um, that will kill you in a second or a very tiny exposure. But chemicals that we are exposed to on a regular basis that have the most impact on human health. Anybody want to guess what the top three would be? 
Mercury. Okay. Wow, you guys are good. Mercury, arsenic, and lead. What's number one? Mercury. Right, that's why I study it. Number two? Number three? Arsenic is number one. Lead number two, mercury number three. This order just switched in the last couple of years. Um, lead is, is now in the number two. Um, so where do you think the most exposure to arsenic is in the U.S. population? Drinking water. Drinking water. Brown rice. Does anybody know this? Does anybody know the rice arsenic story? Okay, so. We're not talking about drinking water, but I think this is a really cool. I think this is a really cool. Uh, so it turns out that in the central southern U.S. states, like Arkansas, Mississippi, they used to grow cotton, right? And to kill the boll weevil, they would spray the fields with arsenical pesticides, actually lead arsenical pesticides. And it turns out that the arsenic that they spray these fields with never goes away. It stays there forever. It doesn't get broken down. It doesn't disappear. Now what they've done is they flooded those fields to grow rice. Rice grows very well in flooded fields. What the water does when you flood the fields is it solubilizes in solution the arsenic in the, in the dirt, brings it up into the water, and then the roots of the plant do a great job of assimilating the arsenic and actually putting it into the husk of the rice kernel. And that's why brown rice has more arsenic in it than white rice. So the brown rice from the central US sources, um, Uncle Ben's, for example, has the most. And you can actually go to Consumer Reports. They have a beautiful article listing the amount of arsenic that you get in rice, brown rice products. Um, West Coast rice. California has a lot less. Rice from um, Southeast Asia actually has a lot less arsenic in it. Brown rice, central US, southern US states has the highest amount. But it's, it's like everything else, it, you know, moderation. If, if you're eating, you know, brown rice every single day, probably be a good idea to buy the brown rice from a vendor who has low arsenic in it. Yes? Sure, because what the organic means is they're not adding anything to it. Okay. So actually, one of the we our the Dartmouth group published a paper about six years ago, and it turns out that there was a, a baby food company who was using organic brown rice syrup to put to sweeten the baby formula, the powdered baby formula. And they were using organic, rather than using sugar, which is, of course, everybody knows is a bad thing. They were using organic brown rice sugar because it's a sweetening agent. The company didn't know that there was arsenic in it. When they had it tested, the level of the company that tested it that they could detect was up here. And the amount, there, were, there was more arsenic in that organic brown rice syrup than any other um, food uh, substance that we tested. And I think we got like 500,000 hits on our website when we published that paper. The, the article was on ABC, CBS, NBC, every single news outlet, Fox, everywhere, bringing um, to the public's attention that this is a serious problem. Mercury exposure is mostly in um, the white albacore tuna, the really, really high food chain tuna. And that's that the mercury accumulates in the food chain. And it comes from the coal-fired power plants in the Midwest, gets in the food chain, and it goes up the food chain, and really bioaccumulates in tuna. I'm not going to talk about that because it's not in the water. Um, the kind of mercury that's harmful is not in the water. So arsenic in human health. As I mentioned, the World Health Organization and the um, EPA, um, arsenic is the number one contaminant of concern for human health worldwide. And I put some images up here to describe the kinds of, of human health effects that the arsenic has. So what would this be? Allergies. Okay, allergies, um, colds, respiratory infections. Breast cancer. Causes breast cancer. Everyone should get this one, right? 
How about this one? We unlock our inner genius. <laughs> Intelligence, IQ, very good. This is a pregnant woman. Remember I said that pregnant individuals, children, are the most at risk? Because at, at, at very low levels, something that wouldn't affect an adult does have an effect on fetal development and on children. Back, these are bacteria, okay? Good, right? Cardiovascular function, heart attacks. And this is pretty disgusting. Skin lesions at high, at high levels, right? This is a, a woman from Bangladesh, actually, who was drinking uh, levels of arsenic uh, 100 times the EPA um, acceptable. Okay, this, this slide's for Maverick. <laughs> what does it say at the top, Maverick? Say it loud. I'm sorry. Right, so this is a study, very good, Mary. So this is a study done in the state of Maine by the Columbia Research Group, that just outside Augusta in the schools, and it found that kids 8 to 10 years old had an approximately, who were exposed to arsenic in their well water that was an untreated, have about an 8, I'm sorry, 5 to 10 point decrease in IQ. And for those of you who know about IQ, that's, that's pretty dramatic. And it's going to have a long-term effect on, on those kids, right? What about in the United States? So this is a map generated by the United States uh, Geographic uh, uh, Services. And what it is, is the entire United States, and when it starts to get yellow, this is when the arsenic level is between 5 and 10, 10 to 50, and over 50 parts per billion. I'll tell you what that is in a minute. You can see we're here right now. This is the whole coast. This is the coast of <clears throat> New Hampshire, coast of Maine. The white just means that they haven't tested it. It doesn't mean that there's zero arsenic there. And you can see there's some hot spots. And this is in well water. This isn't in grounds or, or surface water. And you can see in some states, Wisconsin, Michigan, Central Valley of California, in the Seattle uh, region, the Panhandle, um, and the tip of, of Texas, that there's pretty high um, arsenic um, in the water. And it's been estimated about 25 million Americans are exposed to levels that the EPA considers unhealthy. Originally, in 2001, the EPA um, established a goal of zero arsenic in drinking water. And at that point, they lowered the standard from 50 parts per billion, um, or uh, from 50 to 10 parts per billion, or 10 micrograms per liter. Does anybody have an idea what a part per billion is? Like if I was going to say a timeline of 32 years, what would a 1 billion of 32 years ago. Good, one second, very good. Okay, that was very good. Okay, here's another one. If you took toilet paper from New York to London, how many sheets of toilet paper would be one in a billion? How many? One, good Janet, one. So it's, it's kind of hard to imagine, right, that such a small amount can have such an adverse effect. But both Human studies, epidemiological studies, and um, scientific studies um, that I'll show you some that we've done here in the lab um, do show that very, very small levels of arsenic do have adverse um, health effects. So arsenic, and the tricky part is that arsenic is odorless, tasteless, and colorless, and it's even in chicken McArsenic. <laughs> they use arsenic as a food additive. Um, in chickens? Exactly, because what does it do? Remember that image I showed about the bacteria? It kills bacteria, some bacteria. So the chickens get fatter. Chicken McArsenic. You can't make this stuff up. Okay, what about our local? Right, I'm assuming that many of you are, are local. Arsenic in Maine and New Hampshire well water. 50% of Maine and New Hampshire residences rely on well water, and in this group, it's more than that. Um, so these are the numbers, about 700,000 in Maine and 500,000 people in New Hampshire have wells. 
About 10%, as Jerry was saying, 10% uh, overall in the state of Maine have elevated levels of arsenic. 42% um, of Maine wells um, have, I think that's, sorry, never been tested for arsenic. Um, and in New Hampshire, 30% of wells are contaminated with arsenic, lead, and I just threw the lead and uranium in. So we have a problem. Just so I live in New Hampshire, dark business up here, safe zone. Um, <laughs> but actually that's misleading because there are spot wells that you can test in these regions that do show high levels. So you can never be sure unless you test. But you can see down in the Concord, the state capital, and the seacoast region, there's quite a lot of arsenic. And then our favorite place, right, the state of Maine. Um, we're right here at NDI. Um, anyone want to take a guess what these two towns are? Trenton. So Trenton is here, probably right. Somebody said Surrey. What's the town just south of Surrey? Blue Hill. Blue Hill, right? So Surrey and Blue Hill, and then down here near the state capital, um, Woolbridge, I think is the name of the town down here, that have levels that are quite high. And I'll just... Uh, magnify it a little bit for you so you can get a better closer look at the state of Maine. But basically this whole geological formation, when you drill down into the wells, there's arsenic in that bedrock and that arsenic leaches out into the water. Um, even here on the island, the yeah. north side of the, the MDI has high arsenic levels. And on this, that level is, uh, is it what here? Is it? This one? That one? Some of the wells have 100 to 500. Some of the wells here have 500 to 3,100. I was teaching a course here a couple years ago, and I was talking to the, the students from the University of Maine who were taking the course, and we were talking about arsenic. And one of the instructors just built a house in Blue Hill, and he said, I've never tested my well. It was 3,100 parts per billion. Needless to say, he remediated right <laughs> away. So it raises the question, what's the geologic features that are making arsenic the challenge to the wells? Mm -hmm. Number two, what can you do about it? Okay. Okay. So the geographic features, um, actually, it, it's really hard to figure out because arsenic is one of the most common elements in the Earth's crust. And so it, it's very difficult because just about every bedrock has the capability or the likelihood that arsenic could be there. And I'll talk near the end of, the, of, of my time uh, this afternoon about what you can do about it. Okay. Right. So, and this is actually the introduction to, to that. So, the, the biological lab here in Dartmouth, um, what are we doing about it um, collaboratively? And, well, we're doing research to answer some of the questions that, that you've asked this afternoon. Um, doing studies to raise awareness and education. Um, I just kind of like these images. They don't really like <laughs> That's kind of a cool penguin, right? <laughs> Sorry, Jerry. All right, so getting, getting really serious now, science time. So this, I'm gonna, in the next four or five slides, I'm just gonna tell you some of the studies that we're doing, I think, to answer this gentleman's question about what are the, I think it was you, the safe levels of arsenic, the levels that don't have any biological effects. So here on the island, in the lab here, the bio lab, we study a little fish, a killifish, and they're about actually this big, not that big. They're, they're really tiny, they weigh about two to three grams. And they're very prevalent on the island. And we use them because they're a very nice model organism. Um, and what we use them for is since little is known about the effects of low environmentally relevant levels of arsenic on biological functions, um, we're using this critter to, to, to try to understand how arsenic affects their biology. So killifish are urohaline teleosts, like salmon. Does anybody know what urohaline teleosts means? Salmon. <laughs> I, I can tell you killifish are not good to eat. I think Dave Evans told me that. <laughs> Is that right, Dave? <laughs> not that I would ever try to eat one of them. Salmon are good to eat. Okay, a urohaline teleost is a fish. You all know that salmon spends part of their life in the rivers of Maine and other freshwater rivers, and then they go to sea. So they go 
from a very salty environment to a very fresh water environment. And the way that they can do that is, like if we drank a, a glass of water that had a lot of salt in it, we would pee it out. Our kidneys would just eliminate that from our bodies. But the fish are actually clever. They have gills, and their cells in their gills get rid of the salt. Okay? And the, the, there's a certain protein called the CFTR protein. And that is a, actually a chloride or a salt transport protein that kicks the salt out of their blood. And the interesting thing about CFTR is that's the gene that's mutated in the disease, anybody want to guess? Cystic fibrosis. So the other part of the research that I and my group does at Dartmouth is we're interested in trying to understand how mutations in the CFTR gene cause cystic fibrosis and how to try to find a cure to help patients, kids, with, with this, mute, this genetic mutation. So this is a beautiful model to study the environmental chemicals and to study my favorite protein, the CFTR protein, that is mutated in the disease cystic fibrosis. And I already mentioned this, that what the fish do, and this is just a pretty picture, the blue are the nuclei of the cells, and this red is the CFTR protein that secretes salt into the, into the water to help the fish maintain a normal blood chemistry, okay? So this is an experiment we did here, and we published a couple of years ago, and what this is, is this is mortality on this axis, how many, what percent of fish die, so this would be 50% mortality, 0% mortality, is a function of time when we, change, when we see if they can get rid of the salt from their blood. And these are a whole bunch of control experiments, but these are the fish that were exposed to a high, a relatively high level of arsenic. And you can see that about after uh, five days, four days, um, about 40% of the fish died. So the question was, well, why did they die? And what we found out, and sorry, this is a little bit technical, but what we found out is that normally, when you go from fresh water, FW, to salt water, what happens is the amount of CFTR in the membrane goes up with time. These are the striped bars. Goes up with time. <coughs> and at the same time, this is the amount of chloride, salt, that the fish excrete into the environment. But what we found this is called a western blot. Does anybody know what a western blot is? It's a scientific term. It's looking at the amount of protein in the gills, the amount of the CFTR protein. And you can see control, one, two, three. And you can see with time, this is just a, a, a stain of the amount of CFTR in their gills. In an, an untreated fish, not exposed to arsenic. But this is the, a, a blot from fish that were exposed to arsenic. Can you see? They never get an increase in the CFTR protein. So that's why they can't. Something that arsenic is doing is stopping the production of this protein that excretes the salt back into the water to allow them to survive. And what this shows is that we identified a certain gene called SGK. And again, I'm not going to go into the details. But what arsenic does is arsenic reduces the amount of this gene and its protein product. And what that does is that basically is responsible for blocking the increase in the CFTR protein. Okay? So I know most of you are probably not scientists, so the gist of it is the following. So what arsenic does is it reduces the expression of this gene. And therefore, it causes the degradation of the CFTR chloride channel. The, the CFTR protein goes away. That reduces the ability to secrete salt and blocks the ability of this fish to acclimate to seawater so that the fish dies. Now the interesting question is, does arsenic affect CFTR in humans, in human lungs? And what happens is if you get too little CFTR in the human lung, you get cystic fibrosis. And there are certain drugs that increase the amount of CFTR. What if those individuals are drinking arsenic in their water? Will the drug be more or less effective? Less, less. less effective. So work on a little tiny fish here in the bio lab 
relates to the disease cystic fibrosis and the work that we're doing to try to understand how environmental factors contribute to the disease cystic fibrosis. And in that disease, there is a wide variation of symptoms. Some people live, in fact, unfortunately, that one of my colleagues at Dartmouth has twins. <clears throat> And twin boys, they were 34. One of them, uh, my wife and I went to the funeral in December. The other boy wants to sail around the world. And he just did a transatlantic race. Um, so why does, and they're identical twins. Why does one boy pass away at the age of 34 and the other is relatively healthy? Maybe environmental factors. There, there's some other possibilities as well. But they're not living together. They're adult children, so they're, they're their way uh, from each other. So it could be environmental factors. If we could identify what those environmental factors is, possibly arsenic exposure, other environmental toxins, we could eliminate those kinds of adverse outcomes. Okay, so what else are we doing? Well, um, here, in collaboration again with colleagues at Dartmouth, um, and the lead uh, group is here at the bio lab. There's an environmental, uh, EPA environmental education grant uh, led by Jane Disney, who I think is here. Jane, are you here? There you are. So Jane's the person if you want to learn more of, about the, uh, the grant. And the idea is to build school and community collaborators to eliminate arsenic from drinking water in Maine and New Hampshire. Um, these are three of my colleagues at Dartmouth who are working with Jane uh, on this grant. Um, the grant involves uh, four schools in Maine, three in New Hampshire, creation of a website that's informative. And I think the coolest thing about it is the creation of classroom arsenic curriculum with a focus on watershed and home well testing. Work with science teachers, children to test their wells and educate the kids to get their parents to test and then remediate their wells so that everybody in the family has the minimum exposure to arsenic. And, this is the right way to do a lab test and for arsenic, and this is the wrong way here. Don't stick your toe in, it won't be very informative. Um, so Duncan, uh, Bailey, and uh, Jane were nice enough to sh uh, share some of the data for their project with me. Um, and one question they asked is, have you tested for arsenic before? 41% said they didn't know, 24% said yes, obviously the rest is no. And then here are the data from five of the schools. Um, I put the line here at 10 parts per billion, which is the EPA safe hazards to human health. And you can see Blue Hill, at least, how many wells here were tested? Jane, maybe 20 or 30? 53. 53. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Anna. Yeah. Um, 53 for Blue Hill, Surrey above, Trenton, Pelham Close, and Pinkerton. These are two New Hampshire schools. Um, so the project's been going on for about a year now. I think you have one more year? One more year to go. So the goal is to get a lot more uh, kids and a lot more testing. Um, and I think this is a great program uh, to get the word out to the families. Um, and it involves, like I said, the science teachers in middle school and high schools. It involves the kids, so there's an educational um, and a remediation. Duncan, your question? I, I was going to, going to add, the website for that is, a, which, was, which I built, is an allaboutarsenic.org. Great, thanks. Perfect. Allaboutarsenic.org. Okay. So, in addition to collaborating with Jane and her crew here at the BioLab, um, we have a grant from uh, the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Sciences. Mm -hmm. Um, we too have a, a website. Uh, each web, there's a bunch of different websites. We have one. Duncan and Jane's group has one. Um, and there, this one uh, talks a lot about um, how to test, how to remediate, and some of the, the, the dangers of arsenic. Again, this is up here. This is the, right, this is the main uh, CBC website here. Arsenic in your well water, what to do if your well has too much arsenic. They're saying switch to bottled water. Um, there's a number for advice. Um, and then on the CDC site, they give some other toll-free numbers to get some information. This is our Dartmouth website um, with links to uh, the CDC, New Hampshire Well Water. Duncan, we should get a link to your site. I don't think we have that yet, yeah. do we? 
Oh. We, we should do. If we don't, we, we should do that. Absolutely. We should get a, a leg. Um, right. So at the beginning. Oh, Jan. I'm sorry. Well, they say switch to bottled water. Isn't there another solution to that? We'll talk about that in like two, three slides. From yeah. That's why I was just going to bring up a reverse osmosis. I mean, that's what we were told to do. Our, we had the, you know, initially the EPA said stated that we had, you know, safe levels of arsenic in our water. And then, of course, in 2001, when they changed the levels, lo and behold, they said, oh, no, that was dangerous. So I would be drinking the water all along. If I had, if I had less than 10, I would, I would remediate. So D, as I mentioned before, DES recommends testing wells at least annually. Um, for bacteria and nitrates in every three years for arsenic, radon, uranium, lead, and copper. I think importantly, if any substance is above the recommended levels, a confirmation sample should be collected before making any decisions uh, regarding uh, treatment. Yes? Is there a time during the season that's best to test for arsenic? Does it change over the course of the year? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So it, it turns out that, you know, the aquifers. Did everyone hear the question? Yeah. Oh, so is there a, t a best time or does the amount of arsenic change with the season? But thank you for asking. Um, the, the answer is that it can change and what happens is the aquifer changes, the level of water in your well can change. And you can imagine if there are layers of rock and say there's a layer that's very high up and the water level is low, you might not leach the arsenic in, but in a season where the aquifer comes up, then you leach a lot of arsenic in. So. I think that's part of the reason for testing um, every three years, um, just in case there are fluctuations. Yes, in the back. What about inhaling the, um, like showering? Mm -hmm. Is it just from ingesting it, drinking? Or? Right, that's another, that's another great question. So what, what the, the um, EPA says, if it's higher than 10, you shouldn't drink it. If it's 100 or less, you can shower in it, bathe in it, and you can even cook with it. What was that level? 100. So 100, they say, definitely don't drink it. Anything over 10, they're saying don't drink. They're saying above 10, showering in it's okay, cooking in it's okay, and you know there are, there are a lot of specific recommendations what you should do as part of, part of how much water and the way you should cook. And there's a lot of details on the web, these websites that I when it gets higher than that, um, you saw that, that previous picture of the woman with the, the horrible uh, skin lesions. Yeah. That's what happens. You get these skin lesions um, when you bathe or, or shower. Yes? You mentioned down the south. Level, sorry. You mentioned down south that they spray they use the um, arsenic for the purposes on the cotton. Is, the, is arsenic arsenic, or is there a difference between sort of man-made used versus natural in the rock? There are, there are different man-made used arsenicals. Um, in the rock, it's either arsenic with three charges or five, arsenic three or arsenic five. Man-made, and, and man-made converted by our body, but like rocks are sown, which is the arsenical that they used to feed chickens, um, that has a bunch of methyl groups and some complex chemistry. So there are different kinds of arsenic. Um, it's a great question because what the EPA is talking about when they say 10 parts per billion is the arsenic-3, arsenic-5, not the arsenic that has a methyl, which is a carbon and three hydrogens. So, so is that one from the rock or from man? Rock. Okay. And of course, that's the ones that would be in our wells. <coughs> exactly. Yes. Um, does one need to be concerned about other pharmaceuticals or pharmaceuticals in our water, such as estrogen and opiates and antidepressants and et cetera, et cetera, or is it too many, too few parts per billion to count? So we don't know the answer to that right now, but um, the National Institutes of Environmental Health Sciences is funding research to our group and others to address these issues um, in, in looking at uh, combinations of really low levels, um, and I think that there, there's a potential of low levels of a bunch of these compounds when they get together to have effects. Mm -hmm. But, and, and there's a little bit of data on it, but not the low levels that we're talking about. So, so the real answer is we just don't know yet. The government is funding research on it. Yes? Is the methylated form of arsenic 
more toxic than inorganic arsenic, such as mercury is? Yes. We, we've done studies at Dartmouth that show that it is, um, especially in the immune response to bacterial infections. We just published a paper on that recently that show the monomethylated and the dimethylated form. And the interesting thing is the arsenic in rice is methylated. A good percentage of it is methylated. It depends on exactly which source that you bought the rice from, how much methylated arsenic there is. Yes. Yeah, I was wondering if, I don't want to steal your thunder, but aren't there doublers you could use? That, that may be the next like slide. You're good. Agents <laughs> like You're my I setup guy. Italians <laughs> eat garlic and they don't die from lead pipe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> I, 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 I sense a trace of Italian ancestry here. <laughs> okay. Um, here's, here's, here's what? You figure it. So here's the, this was actually published last year, and it was just published again this, this week, actually, or late last week in the New York Times. Our Ask Well, should you filter your water? And the person who wrote the article wrote, Yes, EPA rules may be too lenient. Some filters may reduce lead, pesticides, chlorine, arsenic, antibiotics, and hormones found in pub regulated public water supplies. So this editorial, this individual, this is the science section of the Times, is recommending that you test, uh, um, that you remediate. Okay. So I'm suggesting that filter, uh, now we're going to talk about the remediation aspect, okay? So I'm suggesting that you filter all drinking water. So remediation, so point of use, okay? So this is the suggest, this is the, uh, the DES and a bunch of other CDC recommendations. Below 250 micrograms per liter or 250 parts per billion, the suggestions are as follows. There's multiple suggestions. First, bottled water, okay? Well, we know that bottled water is expensive. Even if you buy the gallon jugs, it's about a buck a gallon. It generates a lot of waste. The other thing is it's not tightly regulated. Um, we did a study a couple years ago on um, Poland Spring water, we couldn't detect arsenic. Aquafina water, non-detectable. Calistoga water, 32 parts per billion of arsenic. This was about eight years ago. They may have fixed that problem. We haven't retested it. Um, so it's expense, bottled water, expensive, waste, not tightly regulated. Point of use, you can use an adsorption filter like shown here. You can buy a reverse osmosis system, um, water pitcher filter. Whatever you do, first of all, you have, to, you have to check to make sure it's actually taking the arsenic out. And secondly, you have to check um, and maintain the filter. How long does it continue to work? Um, yes? Was yes. industrial reverse osmosis copied from pot? naturally occurring losses around you? Um, there were, so there's for levels, and that's the next one, for whole house point of entry, which would be a whole, where the water comes into your house on the pipe, would be a whole house reverse osmosis system. Um, it depends what else is in your water, um, what kind of arsenic it is, but it generates a lot of waste water, because not all the water goes through the filter, passes through, they can be used, so you actually dump a lot of water out. And that didn't answer your question, did it? What was your question again? <laughs> the naturally occurring moss around here fills this water, I believe. Oh, uh, naturally occurring moss? Uh, yes. Sorry, I don't know. I, un I understood once that reverse osmosis was copied from that. Whereas Canada has most of the world's good drinking water, and it's due to that moss and shot needle kind of presence. Yeah, I, I've never heard anything about that. I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Yes. The carbon filter, does that take out uh, uh, much more than the lead and the other metals? So does, it, does it stop uh, arsenic and stuff like that? So carbon filters don't do a very good job on arsenic. Um, I will show you a couple. <coughs> so here we go. I'll show you um, a couple um, examples of, of, of a study we actually did. So what's the most convenient and cost-effective way to remove arsenic and other toxins from drinking water when it's less than 100 parts per billion? 
And that's 99% of wells. Okay, only a very small percentage of wells are over that 100 part per billion. Okay, so the DARPA Superfund Research Program uh, that, that Jerry mentioned that I direct, we tested five readily available pitcher water filters. We tested 100 and 1,000 parts per billion. And uh, we tested five different water filters. We went to places like Walmart, Home Depot, True Value Hardware, a couple of other big box stores, and just found out what was sort of on the shelf most commonly, and we tested those filters. Anybody want to take a wild guess? I mean, I didn't tell you which filters we tested. Britta. Britta. Britta, you think Britta did the best job with arsenic? <laughs> so for our house, my wife and I bought a Britta filter. For my laboratory, the Dartmouth Biosafety Program told us that Brita filters were acceptable ways to take arsenic out of the water. You ready? All right. Which filter would you buy? Okay, so what we did is this, I'm just showing you limited results. These are the studies we did with a thousand parts per billion of water and we poured it through the filters. This was the control, and then we measured it with a really expensive, a million dollar ICP mass spectrometer. This is the control, a thousand. Zero water, this is how much, when we test the water coming through the filter. Pure, Brita, Home Depot, and Walmart. So Walmart reduced it from like a thousand to 990, to Home Depot, a thousand to 990, um, Brita, maybe to 900. Pure. Um, we've run, to date, we've run 100 gallons through a single filter of zero water that cost $15. The filter cost $15. The filter pitcher cost them $40. Bucks. And we can't measure arsenic on the other side. It takes it all out. And I, I just want to mention my wife's actually a lawyer. So I have a disclaimer here. <laughs> and she's sitting in the back. So the disclaimer says, I have no financial stake or any financial or otherwise anything to gain from promoting the use of zero water filters. What's in the zero water filters? Funny you should ask. <laughs> zero water filters. So there's a coarse filter and there's a multi-layer that using carbon and oxidation reduction alloy is probably a, an iron based. It, they're proprietary so they don't tell you. Then there's a non-woven filter. Um, and the coolest thing about it is that it actually has a, a total dissolved um, a meter that you can actually measure and, and monitor the efficacy. And this is where my buddy um, Maverick is going to help me. You ready, Maverick? All right. Okay, your job is this. Okay, here we'll go. So I'm just going to put this up here for now, just a minute. Just, we'll just note to sit here. <clears throat> so you can imagine, after the, the first time we did the test in my lab at Dartmouth, I came home and told my wife, throw the Brita out, we're going to buy one of these. Okay. <clears throat> so looking at this, these two glasses of water here, what I did is I just went in the back before the, this talk started, and I poured some water right from the tap in here, and some water I poured through here. And I don't remember which one it is, Maverick. Do you remember which one it is? If you did, don't tell anybody. Okay. <laughs> All right. And this, Maverick, hold this up so everybody can see it. So that is a little meter that comes with the filter. It's called a total dissolved solid meter. And basically what it tells you is, is how much just like salt. You know, there's usually a little calcium and a little sodium and other things in the water. And it just tells you how much the, of all that dissolved solids that filter takes out, okay? So anybody want to guess which, which one is through the filter and which one is before the filter? They, and my point is, is that if, I, I assured mom that there's no arsenic in any of the water, so Maverick was willing to help out here. So I don't know, because I sort of switched them up. But there is total dissolved solids in there. So, Eric, you want to pull the end off and you tuck, hit the button so it, the little button, it should say on off. Is it? Yeah, okay. And stick this end in. And what does it read right now, Maverick? Zero, zero, zero. 
Okay, so there's no puzzle to solve, solve it there. What is it reading in that one? Now put it in that one, buddy. Two thirty. Okay. So the total dissolved solid in this were two hundred and thirty, and this filter basically took it all out. At least as measured by by this filter. Which filter is in that now? It's all those. Yeah. So this it, it, it's the combination. It's this thing right. It's this. This is the filter. Mm -hmm. yeah, which number? Oh, it's all of these. It's all of it's, it, it's a combination filter. You oh, see that there's a okay. there's a strainer at the top. Okay. See one, two, three, four, five. Okay. It's everything. And your commission is what? <laughs> Pardon me. <laughs> 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 Those values are part of the million, right? Pardon me? Are those values parts per million? You know, I, I don't know. It doesn't say on the website. Oh. So water is good for us. Absolutely. We can't live without it. Does this yes, filter leave anything good in there for you to drink? H2O. That's all you need. <laughs> and just, I lost my pointer. Uh, thanks, Maverick. Good job. <laughs> Which one would you drink? <laughs> Are you saying that when you get that as close to the distilled water? Yes. So it's, at least it's as accurate as this thing. And what we've done in the lab, we've actually put sodium chloride in and measured it out and uh, to, to get an idea of how much. And if we put 1,000 parts per billion of arsenic in the water, this will register. If we put 100, it will register. If you put 10, it will register. Okay. But there's a lot more in, in this is not. What I'm, I want to make sure I'm clear on this. This is not saying how much arsenic it takes out. What this is saying is how much solid material is taken out. And it's a way to know when the filter needs to be changed. And the company recommends that you change the filter when it reads coming out of 006. Okay? But I wanted to show you um, a little bit more about what this does. And the zero water, so this is Brita filter. And this is the zero water. So the two kinds of arsenic, plus three and plus five, takes out 99%. The Brita, only about 11 and two. Now, to, to Brita's, um, you know, good thing about Brita is it does take out chromium, copper, lead. It takes 97% of the lead out. So does, so does the um, zero water. So Brita is quite good for lead. Um, and some of the other metals, it's quite good. Um, but it varies. But zero is even better. And sorry. Oh, if you want to know about others, I, I have that after the uh, the conclusion. Right. When they put chloride in for your teeth, would that take it out? That will take it out. They don't, they don't uh, mention that in here, but that will take it out. But you, most of us use fluoride toothpaste, right? Now. Yes. What's the supposed scientific uh, benefit of putting fluoride in the water? Of what is stated as the benefit? Uh, I'm not a dentist, but isn't it supposed to do something about preventing cavities? Is that the idea? Allegedly. 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 That's something that I'm not an expert or qualified to answer, but I think that's the reason. Okay. So, just to. We have about five minutes left, um, and I just want to, I think this is my last slide. So I just, my point is, is that test your water. I, uh, my recommendation is test not only your well water, but test the water at your tap. You don't know if, the, if your public water supply is corrosive, leaching lead out of your pipes. You don't know what else is in there. We're relying on our public um, employees to do a good job with the water, but it goes further than that because we just don't know. There was a, a, a new um, uh, group of homes built in Newton, Mass., one of the richest uh, suburbs of Boston, and the pipes were contaminated with lead, and every single house had lead in the water, high levels of lead in the water. Million dollar homes. You would think that in that neighborhood they would have done it the right way, but not necessarily. So just again, contaminates, you want to remediate, you want to take them out. It depends on how much arsenic you have. Go to some of these websites if you want to get more information. 
One in five homeowners in New Hampshire and Maine have unsafe levels of arsenic. If you do it from a commercial source, it only take, costs about 15 bucks. You should also test for other things like E. coli if you have wells, radon, for example. Um, it just takes a couple minutes to collect the sample, and um, you should test it on a regular basis because you want to protect your families, your kids, pregnant women, um, and your pets. And this is actually my youngest daughter. So we want to protect her as well. And this is our dog, our old dog Riley. Okay. So I just want to conclude here um, by thanking all the people. These are my collaborators at Dartmouth. Um, ben King here is at the BioLab. Jane Disney and her colleagues Anna and Duncan. And uh, these are some of the people that work with um, Mrs. Catherine and Mark. And uh, Shannon are some of the people that collaborate with uh, Jane on the, the arsenic and educational program. So I'm happy to stop now. We've got a couple minutes. I'm happy to answer more questions if you like. If we remove all the options, then you have to go into a local grocery store and you have to buy a bottle of water, just you personally, and you're going to drink that unfiltered for a month, which bottle of water do you want? Well, I, I, so I, I just want one name. Full disclosure, yeah. I went to the University of Maine. I'm a summer investigator here. And my great grandfather used to work for Poland Springs. <laughs> Poland Springs. And we've actually tested Poland Springs. Where locally can we get our water tested? Um, the, new, uh, the main, um, is it the DES, Jane, in Maine? The test, who, who's the tester in Maine? AGTL, which is the uh, state lab in Augusta. ATTL. Did everybody hear that answer? No. The state lab. It's called H-E-T-L. H-E-T-L? Mm -hmm. Okay. You can get that, just Google it or something? Right. That's the state lab. I mean, there's other private labs you could go to as well. But water the nice, labs. The nice water thing, lab to do. Any water lab will do. But the nice thing about the state lab is that your data set will end up in the big CDC data set that's yeah. kind of informing it's the USGS and giving us a statewide so these, I'm sorry, I hope no one has an epilepsy here. Um, the, the data that Jane's mentioning, if you go through the state lab, they will, it's anonymized, but they will add to the map that helps people. So in other words, yeah. folks in Surrey and Blue Hill are aware, or at least we're trying to make as many aware as possible. So if you have the state lab measure it, um, then the idea is it goes into the database, and then it's useful for people like Jane's program and others to get the word out to those towns. I mean, if you were in a town here and it was tested and it was all zero, that would give people a little bit of confidence that maybe they don't have to worry so much about it. Um, yes? I, I noticed that you drank out of the third glass. How does the treated water taste? Yeah, right. <laughs> Why did you drink out of the treated water? Because I forgot which one. <laughs> <laughs> The follow-up question is, is why not use distilled water? You, um, you, you could, but it's, it's expensive. I mean, so this this is the, so I live here on campus mm -hmm. in a cottage in the lab, and we've used this all summer, and from my wife, my kids and I, and our dog, I fill this up like four times a day, um, and I, I it tests out at zero still. This is the one we actually use in our house. And so the cartridge is $15 for like, 100 gallons plus, it cost you at least $100. Um, and then you waste all those plastic bottles. You can actually recycle these filters. You throw it in a bag and send it back to the company. And they'll, they say they'll recycle it. You can buy a distiller. You can buy a distiller. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Um, you mentioned ground rice as having high arsenic. What about all the other products you get where water is the main feed source? You know, for milk, wine, you name it. Does anybody test that and write on the label what 
percent that your solids. Are so there's there. actually quite. It, it depends on the wine and the source, but there have been tests that show that there's quite a bit of arsenic in certain wines, mm -hmm. um, because the the the, or, the um, vineyards used to use arsenical pesticides, mm -hmm. and that stays in the ground and then gets gets into the grapes. Cows drink water. Mm -hmm. there, so it's possible. I, I don't think anyone's tested milk that I know of. Nobody's tested milk. I've never read a paper on milk testing. Emma, did you have a comment? So I've been working on this issue for the past couple of years, and this is the first time I've ever heard that there's an over-the-counter filter that you can just buy and you know use it to treat your water. And um, I don't think it's on the CDC website. And I've heard that it's just a huge—I mean, it's a huge problem for people not being able to afford treatment. So I'm just wondering why that's not more widely uh, advocated, and is it a, is it only? Is its effectiveness limited by the contaminants you have in your well, or why, why is that not a solution that's talked about more often? So that's that's a great question. It wasn't planted actually. That's <laughs> <laughs> um, so a couple. Of, so we work with the CDC, USGS, EPA, all the government agencies involved in in you know trying to make water healthy for people. And one of my colleagues uh, is a guy named Joe Ayotte. Not the, he's not related to the senator from New Hampshire. <laughs> Um, he points that out all the time. <laughs> and um, he's, he's a chemist from the, for the United States Geological Survey. And he found that he had, because he lives in the Concord, New Hampshire area, he had high arsenic. He bought a reverse osmosis system, spent $5,000 on it, and it didn't work. So here's a guy with a PhD, chemist. He thinks about this all the time, and it didn't work. The thing is, our public employees CDC, EPA, DES, they cannot tell us what filter, what to use, because it's a conflict, or, right? Because then, you know, you can imagine the water companies, the remediation companies get all mad at them because they recommend one or another. There is no, there's nothing out there, like Emma said. So I got really frustrated. In the beginning of this year, I said, I'm going to do something. So my colleagues and I decided to do the test that, that we showed you, and that there's a ton of data and a lot more that I didn't want to show you. Um, but we're writing a paper right now, and we're going to a meeting in December um, sponsored by the EPA and the National Institutes of Environmental, Environmental Health Sciences, and we're reporting this data. Hopefully when the paper gets published, we will then make it known. And our biggest thing, and Emma and I were talking about this earlier, is that a lot of, I mean, you know, if you have a million dollar house, buying a $5,000 reverse osmosis system, paying somebody to come in and, and check and test it is pretty easy to do. But if you're a low-income person living out in the woods on you know, limited budget, you can't buy a $10,000 water system. You can't go out and buy you know, 10 gallons of a bottled water a day for your family. And you know, this, is, this is cheap. This is turning out to be like 15 cents a gallon, 10 cents a gallon. Um, yes? So if you wanted a filter for your house, then what, what's the option? It depends on the level of arsenic. Um, so you can get reverse osmosis systems that are under the sink, and so every, you know, this gets a little tedious after a while. Um, but I, I personally think it's worth it. Um, but if you have really high levels, then you want a point of entry, which, which means when the water comes into your house, it filters it right there. Because I think the question in the back was, what if your arsenic levels are really high, like over 250? You don't want to shower in that. And you don't, and, You'd have to buy a lot of bottled water to shower. So you want to get a reverse osmosis system. Yes. You've been patient. Your number was um, over 10, don't drink it. But oh, under 100, you can shower in it and cook in it. That's the recommendation. And, the and what about there's farms out here that have well water? And does that, in your opinion, if they take that water and if it has a higher level of 100, if they water their gardens, does this affect the plants, or is it filtered through the soil, et cetera? So some plants don't take it up. Um, rice plants tend to, uh, there's a certain protein that, that transports arsenic into the plants. And, and, and rice plants have it. Many other plants don't. So, so in general, you'd say don't water with heavy arsenic either, water. I probably wouldn't. Right. Okay. Yeah, that was part of my question. And the other part was, does it, uh, like, I, I don't need these, but if it, does it bioaccumulate in the organs? Of no, that's a good question. If, 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 like, mercury does bioaccumulate. Right. Um, lead bioaccumulates, right? right? 
If you drink arsenic, um, it's completely eliminated from your body in 24 to 48 hours. And, it, and, and you can't measure it. Those fish that I showed you, we measure the arsenic in their blood. We give them 10 times the drinking water um, that you'd find in the, in the worst state here, or the worst city here, and we can't measure it in their blood. These, it, these fish it, are really good at excreting it. Does the kidneys take care of it or the liver? Yes, the kidneys. Yeah. Well, the liver actually puts the methyl groups on. You asked before about mm -hmm. methyl. The kidneys put the methyl, I'm sorry, the liver puts the methyl groups on, and then the kidneys excrete it. Yes. So is it safe to drink the distilled products made from grain? Distilled. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, if it's distilled, it, 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 the, the, the distilling process should not leave the uh, Yes. Um, it's sort of a two part question. So you mentioned reverse osmosis for the huh? whole house if there's a high level coming in. Yep. But then you said the guy that used it, it didn't work at all. Right. The, so reason, the reason was is that he also had high, and that's why he had to go and talk to somebody at the government or a professional water person. It depends what else is in your water. Ayat had high iron in his water, and you got to get a pre-filter to get the iron out because the iron rarely rapidly clogs an RO filter. And second part, yes, exactly, exactly. And second part, you mentioned a lot of different contaminants throughout this talk. You focused on arsenic when you're talking about reverse osmosis and especially the zero water. Are any of those other contaminants removed by the zero water or reverse osmosis? Um, Hormones, antibiotics, pharmaceuticals, all those. Things. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Here we go. <laughs> I'm looking at it here. Um, so here we are looking at pesticides. So both Zero and Brita do a pretty good job. And then inorganics like chlorine, nitrate, um, both do a pretty good job. Maybe it depends for the Brita. They, they have other information on their website. I didn't, I didn't copy every single thing from their website. So it takes out a lot of, the filtration takes out a lot, RO will take out a lot more. Mm. Yes. Me? Yes. Yeah, I'd like to share a personal experience. So we have a, a well near Stonesville mm -hmm. and uh, a house there and also in New Jersey. And in both cases, the uh, arsenic levels are less than 10, about 8. So but we're risk averse, so we, we filter. And we have an iron filter uh, under the sink with a little faucet that comes up. And it's a, you know, two, a couple hundred dollars. And the replacement filters are about $115, something like that. And I don't know what that translates to in terms of your 15 cents a gallon, but it's a very inexpensive way. And, it, and it's non-detectable arsenic for about two Excellent. to three years. Excellent. Wow. Really? Two to yeah. three years? Well, that sounds even more cost effective. And, and the person who, from Maine, who does that for the company is called Advanced Water Quality. Mm -hmm. And they're out of Portland, I think, or somewhere. And they're mm -hmm. travel all over the state. Okay. Advanced Water Quality? Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Sure. We're, we just started to work on trying to you know, make these recommendations and find out what, what works. You've been patient. Yeah, could you say again where you can buy the water water? Um, we actually got it on the internet. And Walmart, Walmart and Target. Yeah. Target. We got it at Target, but <laughs> we got it. In, in, but you can also get it like on Amazon or any of these awesome. sites. Um, I'll just say one thing. I'm the wife. Um, <laughs> I love having it because um, even if I had something under the sink, I am like very risk averse, so it makes me feel good to double filter it. But this filter, the zero filter, is sort of slow compared to Brita. So you put the water with the Brita and it goes, and if you're having a party or something, it's right there. Um, so this one, you know, after we use it, we put it under the sink and then we put it in the refrigerator and let it filter while it's in there. But just so be aware that it is, it's working and it's working slowly. Yeah, it is slow. 
takes, I don't know, three, four minutes for it to go through. Britta will go through in like 30 seconds. So the question was, is the reverse osmosis a better way of doing it than this filter? It, it depends on the levels and your, your ability to pay. If, if you have the resources to buy an RO system and you don't want to hassle with this kind of a thing, buy an RO system. Especially if you, have, if you have high levels. If you have over 100, I would not recommend this. 100 and less, this will work. We've actually tested it to 1,000. But the problem with 1,000 is you wouldn't want to bathe in 1,000. You wouldn't want to cook in 1,000. So you'd really want a point of entry reverse osmosis system. Next question. Did you do any research on which one, which one is reverse? I tried to get the wife to buy one and she wouldn't go for the 5,000. We we've never tested an RO system. Anybody who's put their hand up and I haven't, I know a bunch of you have a lot of questions. In the, right in the back there, please. It's a um, new person. I want to make sure everybody gets at least one. Yes. You said that the EPA level, uh, the healthy level, came from 50 parts per billion to 10. Mm -hmm. What evidence was that based on, and what other standards are you now calling into question? That's such a trick. So here's, I'm going to tell the story. So in like 1910 in England, a beer brewer was made beer from wheat that was contaminated with arsenic. And people start, started literally dropping dead. And so what they found was is that if the level of arsenic was below 500, you didn't die immediately. <laughs> so what they said was, well, if 500 kills you, let's see, what would be a good number that wouldn't kill you? Let's divide by 10. <laughs> so they came up with 50. And 50, actually, from 1910 to 2001, was the EPA standard. When we and other people testified to the EPA and the NIH about acceptable safe levels, we recommended to the EPA a level of five. We didn't have a lot of data, but we felt five, an abundance of caution. The EPA wanted to go to five, but it turned out that there were so many public water supplies in the United States that would not meet the standard, and it would cost billions of dollars for them to meet the standard that the EPA decided on a level of 10 because only something like 30 public water supplies would not meet the standard and they were given an exemption. So that's the history of, we still don't know. And that's one of the, the important things that we're trying to do in our program, trying to find out what a healthy level would be. Can I just ask a follow-up really quickly? Of course. So generally, with a lot of these federal standards, are they usually based on some sort of evidence about the biological effects, or are they based more on the kind of system that you described? So in the United States, when a company wants to bring a, like a chemical and add it to food or a cosmetic or whatever, there's something like a 30-day like window where scientists and the public can go and say, you shouldn't do that, here's the scientific evidence. And then once that happens, the company can then go and use it. Then the, the, the burden of proof comes on the science. And it might take 30, 40, 50 years of epidemiological studies and other scientific studies to show that that chemical is bad, and then the EPA will ban it. In Europe, it's the opposite. If you want to add a chemical to food or cosmetics or to something, you have to prove that it's safe to them before they allow it. So the, the two, basically, US versus the European Union have very different uh, ways to, to approve Thing, adding chemicals to food. And there's only like, I can't remember the exact number, but there's only like a dozen compounds that have ever been proven to have adverse health effects that have then been banned. So it's a very small number given the tens of thousands of chemicals that are added to our food. Yes? I just wanted to reiterate the importance of getting your well tested at least annually. And even if you get a quick and dirty like colorimetric test, um, follow it up with a more uh, laboratory-oriented test because we need the data points. We really need the data points to see the distribution of this. I'm a trained geoscientist. 
And I want to also add, in the business of selling water purification equipment, and I'm offering free water analysis in your home with no obligation to buy anything. So if you're interested, please contact me. But also follow up with the laboratory analytical. It's really important to get a better handle on this. I agree. Test your water. Thank you for the comment. It'll be my last. Uh, I done it. <laughs> one is for you, and one is for the group. Okay. The one for you yes. is, um, does boiling water have any effect on reducing arsenic and impurities? Well, as you boil the water and the steam comes off, it will concentrate the arsenic. Gotcha. Now, if you take the steam yeah, and I then mean, condense it. Fine, this for the group. Has, does anyone know if the uh, Mount Desert Island spring water in Southwest Harbor has been tested? Spring water. So the, at the, at the, at the uh, who sells the water in Southwest Harbor? Mount Desert bottled water. Has anybody had, Does anybody know if it's been tested? Usually the. You know, they, they, so they bring the bottles of the water. The FDA house. I is know. responsible for that. Should, should that come? So no one's tested it. I have not tested it. And, uh, this is the group question. No one here knows. So B, should they have a certificate on their wall that says they get tested regularly? Okay. I think they do, actually. Okay. Yeah. Well, the thing is, you know, like a lot of, one of the things that, that <laughs> you have to do is you say, you call up a, a water testing company, you say, I test my, my water. Sometimes there's like a box you check off and they test for E. coli and radon and maybe some radionuclides. And they may, in that sort of test that you checked off, may not include arsenic. Mm -hmm. So you have to, if you want to make sure that they're going to test for arsenic, you have to ask to make sure that what you're going to... Why I say that is they, they at least verbally hold themselves out as the purest water in Maine. Yes? I know that for some food producers, like I used to sell at the at farmers markets and I made big goods and I part of my being certified through part of being with the test of my water that I use is I I mentioned it briefly, but um, I'm not an expert in that area, but you clearly want to get the radon and uranium and radon and all that bad stuff out. Our own will take out most of the radon. It's a pretty large Okay. Anything else? Thanks so much for your question.